9. Spring. It seeped unseen into the waiting red earth in early March, softening the hard ground for the coming plow and awakening life that had lain gently sleeping through the cold winter. But by the end of March, it was evident everywhere. In the barn where three new calves bellowed and the chicks the color of soft pale sunlight chirped. In the yard where the wisteria and English dogwood bushes readied themselves for their annual Easter plume. And the fig tree budded producing the forerunners of juicy brown fruit for which the boys and I would have to do battle with fig-loving Jack. And in the smell of the earth itself, rain-drenched, fresh, vital, full of life, spring enveloped all of us. I was eager to be in the fields again, to feel the furrowed rows of damp, soft earth beneath my feet, eager to walk barefooted through the cool forest, hug the trees and sit under their protective shadow. But although every living thing knew it was spring, Miss Crocker and the other teachers evidently did not, for school lingered on indefinitely. In the last week of March, when Papa and Mr. Morrison began to plow the east field, I volunteered to sacrifice school and help them. My offer was refused, and I trudged warily to school for another week. I guess I won't be seeing much of y'all after next Friday, said Jeremy one evening as we neared the forest trail. Guess not, said Stacy. Be nice if our schools end at the same time. You crazy, I cried remembering that Jefferson Davis didn't end dismiss until mid-May. Jeremy standard, stammered an apology. I, I just mean we could still see each other. He was silent a moment, then brightened. Maybe I could come over and see y'all sometime. Stacy shook his head. Don't think Papa would like that. Well, I just thought, he shrugged, sure I'll be lonely without y'all. Lonely, I asked, with all them brothers and sisters you got? Jeremy frowned. The little ones, they too young to play with. The older ones, Lily and Jean and R.W. and Melvin, I guess I don't like them very much. What are you saying? asked Stacy. You can't like your own sisters. You can't not like your own sisters and brothers. Well, I can understand that, I said somberly, or soberly. I sure don't like them. But they're his kin. A fellow's got to like his own kin. Jeremy thought about that. Well, Lily and Jean's all right, I guess. She ain't so persnickety since Cassie stopped being her friend. He smiled a secret smile to himself. But that R.W. and Melvin, they ain't very nice. You ought to see how they treat T.J. He halted, then looked up embarrassed and quiet. Stacy stopped. How they treat him? Jeremy stopped. I don't know, he said, as if he was sorry he'd mentioned it. They just don't do him right. How? asked Stacy. Thought you didn't like him no more. Well, I don't, replied Stacy defensively. But I heard he was running around with R.W. and Melvin. I wondered why. Their brother's ears must be 18 or 19. Jeremy looked up at the sun, squinted, then glanced up his forest trail a few feet ahead. They brought TJ by the house a couple times when Paul wasn't home. They treated him almost friendly-like, but when he left, they laughed and talked about him, called him names. He squinted again at the trail and said hurriedly, I better go. See y'all tomorrow. Mama, how come you suppose R.W. and Melvin putting in time with TJ? I asked as I measured out two heaping t tablespoons of flour for the cornbread. Mama frowned down into the flour barrel. Only one tablespoon, Cassie, and not so heaping. Mama, we always use two. That barrel will have to last us until Papa goes back to the railroad. Now put it back. As I returned one tablespoon of flour to the barrel, I asked again asked, What do you think, Mama? How come them Sims is running around with TJ? Mama measured out the baking powder and gave it to me. It was a teaspoon less than we have been using, but I didn't ask her about it. It was running low, too. I don't really know, Cassie, she said, turning to the stove to stir the milk into the butter beans. They may just want him around because it makes him feel good. If TJ's around me, he don't make me feel good. Well, you told me Jeremy said they were laughing at TJ behind his back. Some folks just like keeping other folks around to laugh at them, use them. wonder how come TJ don't know they laughing at him. You suppose he's that dumb? TJ's not dumb, Cassie. He just wants attention, but he's going after it the wrong way. I was going to ask what use TJ could possibly to be to anyone, but I was interrupted by a little man running into the kitchen. Mama, he cried, Mr. Jameson just drove up. He had been in the barn cleaning the chicken coop with Christopher John and stubby particles of straw still clung to his head. I grinned at his must used appearance, but I didn't have time to tease him before he was gone again. Mama looked at Big Ma, a question in her eyes, then followed little man outside. I decided that the cornbread could wait and dashed after them. Girl, get back in here and finish fixing that cornbread, ordered Big Ma. Yes, am I said, I'll be right back. Before Big Ma could reach me, I was out the back door running across the yard to the drive. Mr. Jameson touched his hat as Mama approached. How you doing, Miss Logan? he asked. Just fine, Mr. Jameson, Mama answered. And yourself? Fine, fine, he said absently. Is David here? He's over in the east field. 
Mama studied Mr. Jameson. Anything wrong? Oh, no, no, just want to speak to him. Little man, Mama said. Turning, go get Papa. Oh, no, don't do that. I'll just walk over there if that's all right. I need the exercise. Mama nodded. And, af and after he had spoken to me, Mr. Jameson crossed the yard to the field. Little man and I started to follow after him, but Mama called us back and returned us to our jobs. Mr. Jameson didn't stay long. A few minutes later, he emerged from the field alone, got into his car, and left. When supper was ready, I eagerly grabbed the iron bell before Christopher John or Little Man could claim it and ran into the back porch to summon Papa. Mr. Morrison and Stacy from the fields. As the three of them washed up on the back porch, Mama went to the end of the porch where Papa stood alone. What did Mr. Jameson want, she asked, her voice barely audible. Papa took the towel Mama handed him, but did not reply immediately. I was just inside the kitchen, dipping out the butter beans. I moved closer to the window so I could hear this answer. Don't keep anything from me, David. If there's trouble, I want to know. Papa looked down at her. Nothing to worry about, honey. Just seems that Thurston Wallace has been down town talking about how he's not going to let a few smart colored folks ruin his business. So he's going to put a stop to the shop in Vicksburg, that's all. Mama sighed and stared out across the plowed field to the sloping pasture. I'm feeling scared, David, she said. Papa put down the towel. Not yet, Mary. It's not time to be scared yet. They're just talking. Mama turned and faced him. And when they stop talking, then, then maybe it'll be time. Right now, pretty lady, he said, leading her by the hand toward the kitchen door. Right now, I've got better things to think about. Quickly, I poured the rest of the butter beans into the bowl and hurried across the kitchen to the table. As Mama and Papa entered, I slid onto the bench beside little man and Christopher John. Papa beamed down at the table. Oh, well, look here, he exclaimed. Good old butter beans and cornbread. You better come on, Mr. Morrison. You too, son, he, he called. These women folks gone done and fixed us a feast. After school was out, spring drooped quickly toward summer, yet Papa had not left for the railroad. He seemed to be waiting for something, and I secretly hoped that whatever that something was, it would never come so that he would not leave. But one evening, as he, Mama, Big Mom, Mr. Morrison, and Stacy sat in the front porch, while Christopher John Littleman and I dashed around the yard chasing fireflies, I overheard him say, Sunday, I'm going to have to go. Don't want to, though. I got this gut feeling it ain't over yet. It's too easy. I released the firefly imprisoned in my hands and sat beside Papa and then Stacy on the steps. Papa, please, I said, leaning against his leg. Don't go this year. Stacy looked out into the falling night, his face resigned and said nothing. Papa put out his large hand and caressed my face. Got to, Cassie girl, he said softly. Maybe there's bills to pay, pay and ain't no money coming in. Your mom's got no job come fall and there's the mortgage and next year's taxes to think of. But Papa, we planted more cotton this year. Won't that pay the taxes? Papa shook his head. With Mr. Morrison here, we was able to plant more, but that cotton is for living on. The railroad money is for taxes and the mortgage. I looked back at Mama, wanting her to speak, to persuade him to stay. But when I saw her face, I knew that she would not. She had known he would leave, just as we all had known. Papa, just another week or two, couldn't you? I can't, baby. May have lost my job already. But Papa, Cassie, that's enough now, Mama said from the deepening shadows. I grew quiet, and Papa put his arms around Stacy and me his hands falling casually over our shoulders. From the edge of the lawn, where Little Man and Christopher John had ventured after lightning bugs, Little Man called, Somebody's coming! After a few minutes later, Mr. Avery and Mr. Lanier emerged from the dusk and walked up the sloping lawn. Mama sent Stacy and me to get more chairs for the porch. Then we'd settled back beside Papa, still sitting on the steps, his back propped against a pillar facing the visitors. You going up that store tomorrow, David? Mr. Avery asked after all the amenities had been said. Since the first trip in January, Mr. Morrison had made one other trip to Vicksburg, but Papa had not gone with him. Papa motioned to Mr. Morrison. Mr. Morrison and me going the day after tomorrow. Your wife brought down the list of the things you need yesterday. Mr. Avery cleared his throat nervously. It's, it's that list that come about, David. I don't want them things no more. The porch grew silent. When no one said anything, Mr. Avery glanced at Mr. Lanier. Mr. Lanier shook his head and continued. Mr. Granger making it hard on us, David. So we're going to have to give him 60% of the cotton instead of 50 now that the cotton's planted and it's too late to plant more. Don't suppose, though, it makes much difference. The way cotton sells these days seems like the more we plant, the less money we get anyways. Mr. Avery's coffin interrupted him, and he waited patiently until the coffin had stopped before he went on. I'm going to be hard put to pay that debt in Vicksburg, David, but I'm going to. I want you to know that. Papa nodded, looking toward the road. I suppose Montier and Harrison raised them percentages, too, he said. Montier did, said, replied Mr. Avery, but as far as I know, Mr. Harrison ain't. He's a decent man. That does it, Mama sighed wearily. Papa kept looking out into the darkness. Forty percent. 
I expect a man used to living on fifty could live on forty if he wanted to hard enough. Mr. Avery shook his head. Time's too hard. Times are hard for everybody, Papa said. Mr. Avery cleared his throat. I know. I feel real bad about what T.J. done. I wasn't talking about that, said Papa flatly. Mr. Avery nodded self-consciously, then leaned forward in his chair and looked out into the forest. But, but that ain't all, Mr. Granger said. Said, too, we don't give up this shopping in Vicksburg. We can just get off his land. Said he's tired of us stirring up trouble against decent white folk. Then them Wallaces, they come by my place, brother Lanyers, and everybody's on this thing that owes them money. Said we can't pay our debts. They're going to have the sheriff get us out, put us on chain gang to work it off. Oh, good Lord, exclaimed Big Mama. Mr. Lanyard nodded and added, Got to go up to that store by tomorrow to show good faith. Mr. Avery's coffin started again, and for a while there was only the coffin and the silence. But when the coughing ceased, Mr. Lanyard said, I pray to God that there's a way we could stay in this thing, but we can't go on no chain gang, David. Papa nodded. Don't expect you to, Silas. Mr. Avery laughed softly. We sure had him going for a time, though, didn't we? Yes, Papa agreed quietly. We sure did. When the men had left, Stacy snapped. They got no right pulling out. Just because the Wallaces threatened them one time, they go jumping over themselves to get out like a bunch of scared jackrabbits. Papa stood suddenly and grabbed Stacy upward. You, boy, you don't get so grown up you go talking about more than you know. Them men, they doing what they got to do. You got any idea what a risk they took just go shopping in Vicksburg in the first place? They go on that chain gang, their family's got nothing. They'll get kicked off that plot of land they tend, and there'll be no place for them to go. You understand that? E e yes, sir, said Stacy. Papa released him and said, stared moodily into the night. You were born blessed, boy, with this land of your own. If you ain't been, you'd cry out for what for it while you were trying to survive, like Mr. Lanyard, Mr. Avery. Maybe even do what they're doing now. It's hard on a man to give up, but sometimes it seems there just ain't nothing else he can do. I I'm sorry, Papa, Stacy muttered. After a moment, Papa reached out and draped his arm over Stacy's shoulder. Papa, I said, seeing to join them. We given up too? Papa looked down at me and brought me closer. Then he waved his hand toward the drive. See that fig tree over there, over yonder, Cassie? Them other trees all around, that oak and walnut, they're a lot bigger and they take up more room and give so much shade they almost overshadow that little old fig. That fig tree's got roots run, that runs deep and it belongs in that yard as much as that oak and that walnut. Keeps on blooming, bearing good fruit year after year, knowing all the time it'll never get as big as them other trees. Just keeps on growing and doing what it gotta do. It don't give up. It give up, it'll die. There's a lesson to be learned from that little tree, Cassie girl, because we're like it. We keep doing what we gotta do, and we don't give up. We can't.